Well, welcome back to the main stage. Up next, we have Amir Rapson, CTO and co-founder at vFunction, to talk with us about key benefits of modernizing monolith legacy applications to microservices with the Strangler uh, pattern. Amir, welcome to the main stage and go ahead and take it away. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Amir and um, I'm the co-founder of vFunction. Uh, this is my email over here and I'm happy to talk about uh, modernizing monolithic applications and using AI and data science uh, in order to solve software architecture problems. So if you're interested, you could feel free to reach out. Uh, I want to talk about what is a good microservice and what is the method to really extract the service from a monolith. But maybe let's start first with explaining why you would like to do that. So first of all, this is part, this is really a general problem in the world modernizing applications. So people are interested in modernizing applications. It's very interesting to see that application modernization has passed cloud migration as a key investment, meaning people are not only interested in migrating to the cloud anymore, but they really are interested to modernize the application. And I see it as a more um, holistic view of um, existing applications and, and existing software architecture that you get more from modernizing application, not just simply by migrating them. Because mo modernizing really solves a business pain point, or it should solve a business pain point. That's the reason you should modernize. modernize. Uh, these pain, po pain points are, uh, with an application, you start with having long test cycles for an application, which lead to long release cycles. Uh, it means that you're not able to meet your business requirements. You're not able to innovate fast enough. Uh, as the application becomes more and more complex, it's hard to ramp up your developers. So for instance, we've seen uh, companies where the application has gotten so big that it takes about a year to ramp up a new developer. And, and at that time, developer satisfaction is not so high so um, so they end up staying for like two years. So it means that out of these two years they spent in the company, a, a, only a full year was um, only used to ramp up, ramp them up. Uh, and that's of course frustrating and a business pain point. And all of that leads to poor customer satisfaction, poor user experience, poor developer experience. And, and, um, and this, at this point, you really need to break up the application into microservices in order to solve all of these problems. Now, the problem is that today, modernizing a monolith or taking a microservices from a monolith is really done the wrong way. Uh, people do it usually by sitting in a room and not looking at the source code. Um, like event storming is, is intentionally not supposed to look at the source code. So you get this top-down design but a top-down design of the application doesn't take into account how the application is built. And actually, when you think about it, there's no, there are no tools to support the design process. So, you, so even if you make a design decision on the software architecture and how you want to extract a, a service from a monolith and strangle it later, you, you don't have any way of getting feedback if that's the right architecture, the wrong architecture. What does it mean? Will you be able to do that or not? And at the end of the day, when architects tell developers, okay, I want this service to be extracted this way, um, developers end, end up focusing on really menial tasks, like making it compile, like taking this class and this class and making it compile up, up until the point they reach like a, uh, like a cyclic dependency. They can't really compile it. They go back to the architects and they say, well, that's not going to work. So that leads to failure. And according to this uh, latest 2022 Wakefield report, uh, many of the modernization efforts in the world today fail. So modern, when we talk about modernization here, we do speak specifically of taking a monolithic application and breaking it apart into microservices or rewriting it as a new application. But, uh, or, but, but starting with... But uh, we're talking about some way of starting with a monolithic application and ending up with microservices. And we see that 79% of these um, projects fail. And, and they fail after um, organizations spent like an average of $1.5 million on them and spending like 16 months of work 
um, on these modernization projects. So 79%, $1.5 million on all of these um, projects. That's a lot of money and time wasted. So what is it that you really need? So you need a new methodology for application modernization, one that is based on intelligent metrics-based and, and a bottom-up design that allows you to assess and analyze the application and really come up with an architecture while also finding some architectural smells and dead code. Uh, whatever you use for an AI or data science in order to solve you this problem, you also need it to be interactive because the best thing any algorithm can solve you is what is the best way based on how the application is built. But how the application is built at the moment, as long as you're modernizing it, many times you do want to merge your top-down view with your the way your with with the analysis the bottom-up analysis of the application. So you do need this feedback loop between what you want to to get based with what you have and, and kind of find the right um, way to marry them together in order to get uh, something that's, uh, that you're capable of doing. And you also want to automate and accelerate those error-prone dev tasks, like taking applications, taking sources, taking classes, compiling them together, severing dependencies by commenting out code so you can remove that code, minimize property and configuration files. It's really a big, big bother. And people have, it's so easy to make mistakes, getting tired by adding by solving compilation issues. Um, so you really need to do all that. So we, we built this uh, a platform that does this. And, uh, and what I want to show you now and talk a little bit now is really um, what are the metrics that we found or what really makes a good microservice. So I'll skip a couple of slides and I'll talk about what's really the portrait of a good microservice. So, um, so if we ha start with a monolithic application, and we and I convince you that it's a good thing to start with like a bottom-up approach with analyzing the code, you do need to decide what makes a good service uh, when when you come up with some algorithm to find it. So the first metric that I'm gonna uh, gonna con try to convince you that it's the key metric for a good service is exclusivity. I'll talk a bit about it in a second. Common code, common code is all of those um, methods and classes that are used throughout your application. So even if you want to extract a certain service, you still need that common code in multiple services. We'll talk about dead code that makes your app that or dead dependencies that really make your application very very heavy, and the need to find a simple service topology. So we'll talk about all of these metrics. But when I talk about all of these, I, I want to urge you to think about two things. When you're looking at a project of taking a monolithic application and splitting it into services, where you know that the chances of failing with such a, such a project are so high, you need to be making the good decisions. So the first tip I want to give you is to be practical. It's never perfect, OK? You need to come up with, you need the project to be a successful one. You don't need necessarily a perfect architecture. Okay, so make practical decisions. The second is to think iteratively. Sometimes, especially with really big applications, like application like over 10,000 classes, um, which is more common than you'd like to think. Um, sometimes it's not the right thing to do is to split them up into microservices. Sometimes the right thing to do is, for instance, to refactor parts of these applications, deal with uh, class dependencies and the internal structure of the application. Um, and you see that based on bad metrics uh, when, when you try to think about the decomposition of the system. And then after you solve this refactoring, analyze the application, after you refactor these pieces of complexity within your monolithic application, measure it again. Get another architecture. Look, for, look if the exclusivity is better, the common code is, is smaller, uh, more dead code, more pieces that you can extract from the application, etc. So be practical. So let's start by talking about exclusivity. So exclusivity, I said I wanted to convince you that this is really the key metric for what's a good service. So uh, an ex so let's define it. So ex an exclusive entity is an entity that appears only in a single service. 
So we can think about that entity, for instance, as a class. We need a class to appear only in a single service in the application. If we're talking about a monolithic application and we were extracting a service and that service has a class, we want the, the class to appear only in that service. It means two things. First of all, if a class is some part of a domain, thinking about like a domain-driven design, right? So if you're thinking about the class as part of the domain, you want that service to have the exclusivity of domain. So you want the, mo the, the highest degree of classes that are exclusive to the service. Uh, there is also, um, uh, so classes not only, only when, also when you extract a service and so you want to extract a service uh, and you want, um, you want to uh, take these classes and remove them from the monolith, right? There is, you want to do either one of two things, either simplify the monolith or reduce it in size. So if a class is, can be exclusive to a service, then you can remove it from the monolithic application, add it only to the service and, and, and decrease the size of the monolith. Now, exclusivity is not only about classes, it's also, also about context and objects and uh, and and let's say let's just choose an example database tables like access to database tables or access to JDBC connections if it's an uh, a Java application so access to a database connection let's say there's an object that that handles access to a database table to a certain database table so you want um, access to a, a certain database table to be exclusive to a single service right? Uh, again, a database table may hint to uh, a certain domain of some functionality within your software. So you want exclusivity of that domain within your service. Um, if you're th thinking about like a good microservice, uh, according to the literature, many times it has to come with its own database. So own database, meaning you want if it's if you can... Um, treat a database table as exclusively or define it uh, the architecture in a way that the database table database table is used exclusively in a single service then that microservice will be able to use its own database um, but it could also be treated like these exclusivity of entities can also be treated as constraints if you have a current monolith and you have let's say a synchronization object or a lock and you see that there's two separate threads or call stacks that access the same lock object or synchronization objects, then sometimes um, going back to the practical view, sometimes the, the idea of being practical is to take these two um, call stacks and just putting them together, even if they're not of the same domain. So exclusivity doesn't only promise you that you're taking out whole domains, it also uh, tries to minimize the constraints or the amount of refactoring that you'll have to do while extracting that piece of code from the monolithic application. Um, lastly, uh, you need to, one important thing with uh, carrying out this exclusivity is understanding that there are two um, very uh, trivial solutions to exclusivity. One is a monolith, right? If you think about a monolithic application, a monolithic application, every class is exclusive in it, right? It's one giant uh, service. All the classes are exclusive to it. So obviously that's not a good solution. Another solution is to take every class by its own and have, so instead of method calls to other classes, um, just use APIs, right? So that will give you 100% exclusivity for each and every service because each and every service has its own class. But obviously these are not good solutions. So you need to optimize, think about optimization to the number of services that make sense to you. And, uh, and the number of services that make sense to you from a monolith is also about how your organization is currently, um, what your organization is currently capable of. Because if you think, uh, think about like you're moving from a 10,000 class monolith, you're not going to go to 10,000 microservices and be like an Uber or Netflix, right? You need to take to, to take the practical approach and take it iteratively and think about like if it's a 1 million lines of code application, maybe 20, 30 services to start with. 
Um, Okay, one thing I want to talk about exclusivity is also the data layer. So we talked a little bit about the data layer that um, that traditionally <laughs> the data layer should not be shared between multiple services. So a database table should be accessed only from a single service. Um, and the question is that arises when you think about this uh, architecture, if refactoring a certain application, should we also immediately split the data layer? So this is exactly when I'm, I'm asking you to be more practical. Uh, splitting the code is reversible, reversible, okay? You take a service, you strangle a service based on the original code. You're not happy with it, go back to the monolith, try it a different way, split it a different way, come up with a different architecture, split it in a different way. If you do that and start to migrate data from your database, at that point, it's irreversible. The price of being wrong after touching the database is much higher than without touching the database. So refactors first and split the database later. It doesn't mean that you don't need to take the data layer into account where when coming up with an architecture, you definitely have to take that into account, but it's not like the one number one priority. It's not that if you don't have separate a separate database that you, you don't have a microservice, okay? It's, um, a microservice is supposed to solve a business problem, one of those business problems that we talked about in the beginning. If you feel that with this architecture, even without the microservice having its own database, you're solving these problems by independent um, deployment, by uh, easy to ramp up developers, easy to re refactor parts of it, easy to add tests so you can test it, test it faster, it's worth it. Common code. So common code is another key element of figuring out the right um, uh, architecture and, uh, and another key element in, um, for an algorithm to find uh, a good decomposition of a, of a monolith into services. So not every class can be exclusive, okay? And I'm not just talking about like string utils. Um, it could be your own like common code. So, and you need to identify which classes in your application are these common classes. It's not a simple task, okay? But these common classes are exactly what tie your code together and create dependencies. And when we develop code, and code has a life cycle of its own, sometimes you write a method and it doesn't start off as very common, but then more domains are added to your application as your application grows. And these methods start to act as uh, performing some functionality to more than one domain. Okay, so you need to, so if you, and if you don't strip those classes immediately, and especially if these classes have dependencies back to core business logic, it's very hard to tear them apart. So taking the common code, defining it and putting it in the library it is really um, a, a way to keep your architecture clean. Uh, you can also think about it that if any code, any class that kind of connects between two different um, pieces of code uh, are, are only in a library, it's very easy to get to a modular monolith. And from a modular monolith, it's very easy to get to a microservices architecture. So finding those common classes and, um, and find... Uh, I'm not saying that finding which classes are should be common and not common is easy, but if you do that, uh, the rest of the job uh, is much easier. Now, of course, it's very important to take this common code into consideration because the common code is a potential monolith. Again, if we're talking about the trivial solution, putting everything in a library uh, and then just having like a controller class for each uh, service, that's a simple trivial solution to, uh, to uh, extracting uh, microservices from a monolith, but you're not solving any business problem. You still have this big uh, ball of mud as a library. Anytime you touch a service, you have to deploy all the services because every time you touch it's in a common library. So you really need to be careful with it. And, uh, and if you're interested, we also wrote some, um, some articles around how to identify common code just by looking at the topology of the call stacks. Um, and uh, if you reach out, I'm happy to share that research with you. Uh, but this is, again, if we're talking about exclusivity as the key metric, figuring out the common code and your common library uh, is the second most important thing. 
dead code. Uh, dead code is another uh, uh, piece that's important to figure out. When we write code, we never consider compiled time dependencies. Okay, I mean, of course, we sometimes <laughs> consider it, especially when we use like inversion of control and and stuff like that. But when we write, we write it like very much. We think about which class should call which other class that should call which other class or method which should call which other method, and not necessarily. Um, sorry, and not necessarily uh, thinking about which other classes it brings. So one one thing we get is cyclic dependencies, which are a he which are hell and will require refactoring if you want to decompose the monolith. But many times we get code that's not necessarily unreachable code, uh, but it's unreachable within a certain domain. So if there's a certain class, think about it like a certain class that did one function and again split up into two different domains, start serving two different domains. But then that class continued that half of it is, rele is relevant to one domain and half of it is relevant to another. All of the dependencies of that class are not relevant to both domains. So when you start thinking about that class as something that you might split up or might duplicate into two different services, you definitely don't want to take all of their dependencies because if you are, you're taking a lot of dead code with you. One algorithm that allows you to um, take that into account is to use dynamic analysis. So to understand, to profile an application, to understand how it runs. So you see all of that uh, pieces of code where a developer decided to uh, write it method by method by method, and then superimpose on that all the static data. So if the, all the static dependencies, so well, if you did static analysis and dynamic analysis data, dynamic analysis put on top the static analysis, the difference between what's the, uh, what's a compiled dependencies versus what's running, many times that's going to be your dead code. Okay, so that's another thing that's very important to figure out. And then lastly, that's the last thing I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to uh, answer some questions that I see here. You need to figure out a simple service topology. So think about your topology. You don't want to go full mesh on day one. Okay. Again, same practical approach. You're not, if you're not an Uber or Netflix, you're not going to go full mesh. Uh, don't think about it. It's 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 hard. Uh, it's hard to figure out observability. It's hard to figure out the deployments. You'll figure it out, but not on day one. So think about two different topologies. One is like a hub and spoke topology. Uh, like you have uh, services that that, that uh, are called from, let's call this like a, a strangler facade, okay? Some load balancer that, that figures out how, when to call your service instead of the original monolith as you strangle your monolith. Um, but these don't have any communication between them. Or like a two-layered architecture when you have like foundation services that serve um, as a simple for a simple services that, that perform something simple, you can think of them as like a, also libraries, but deployed as services. And another layer of business services that need those foundation services, but try not to have like anything hop between them. So there's, there's a business service that can call different foundation services. Another business service can call the same foundation services, but they don't sh but shouldn't interact with each other. That will simplify your topology. Um, and I think that that's it. I'll, I'll put this on. Um, uh, we, we deal a lot with using data science and AI for software architecture. Um, this uh, QR code will give you like a free assessment of your application. So you kind of get a, a feeling of how to use static analysis also to assess the level of technical debt in your application, which may be another talk for another time but I'll answer questions now. Um, one question that came up was, is it not the idea not to bring baggage from the monolith to design this, the, the, the microservices primarily driven by DDD? So, you know, I'm, I'm gonna say my opinion, okay? First of all, we see, according to that Wakefield report, that not taking into account the monolith is not necessarily a recipe for success. Okay, so 80% failure is a high degree failure. Um, we have 
seen many modernization projects already with our approach and with our approach we see something around 90 percent success so 90 percent success versus 80 percent failure maybe it's a better way to do domain driven design so it's definitely domain driven design right but it's not event storming it's just ai based domain driven design um how can we have access to the articles that i said um, Amir at vfunction.com, reach, reach out on LinkedIn, uh, reach out on email. I'll be happy to share uh, and talk more if you'd like. And I think that's it, unless you have uh, any more questions, which I'm happy to uh, answer. Okay, Amir, thank you for the great talk. Uh, we'll be back on the main stage in about 30 minutes.